Uh, uh, good afternoon, and it's a pleasure to be invited to address um, the Board of Deputies for the first time and on such an important topic, because the choice we make at the end of June is potentially the biggest decision that this country will take in a generation. And depending on the outcome of that decision, it's a decision that will have ramifications for this country, not just over the course of this year or this decade, but potentially over the course of the next century as the United Kingdom decides um, the direction uh, that we take and potentially our national destiny in the process. And I'm arguing this, this afternoon that we should remain in the European Union because we are stronger, safer and better off. Picking up where Daniel left off on the economy, the single market is the best economic relationship we can have with the European Union and it has been striking throughout the course of this entire referendum debate and all of the work that we've been doing on the Treasury Committee looking at the economic implications of our membership and the alternatives available that the Leave campaign cannot point to a single country in the world that has a better relationship with that single market than we do as members of the European Union. And it brings enormous benefits. We can trade without tariffs. We get a say over the rules. It expands our home market from 65 million consumers to 500 million consumers. Figures estimate that there are three to four million jobs linked to the European Union. In fact, throughout the course of this debate, we can trade um, statistics and argue about which statistic is more valid than the other. But the truth is that whoever's producing these analyses puts these figures in the same ballpark. Three to four million jobs. The impact of leaving um, being equivalent to losing £4,300 per household each year. Um, Daniel talks about the cost of EU membership. The Independent Institute for Fiscal Studies puts our net contribution at £5.7 billion, which equates to 24 pence per person per day. Given the enormous benefits, I don't think that's a hugely, a hugely uh, costly sum. In fact, it's 1% of our budget. Uh, the Leave campaign argues we should use far more inflated figures, and that's why the UK Statistics Authority has written to them previously to warn that their figures are potentially uh, misleading. And as we've seen... Um, over the course of the last century, for better or for worse, if the economy works well, the country does well. If the economy collapses, um, people's jobs, their livelihoods, their homes are put at risk. Why on earth would we leave an economic arrangement that is working so well for our country? And of course, it's not just an economic case. It's also about our security and about our safety and about how we tackle the big issues of this century. Our security cooperation makes us better placed to deal with crime and with security, whether it's the European arrest warrant that allows us to um, arrest people across the continent and to bring them to justice here in the UK, or cooperation on tackling terrorism, whether on our shores, across the European Union, or across the rest of the world. Being members of the European Union has brought enormous benefits in terms of employment rights, in terms of human rights. And whilst this country can be enormously proud of our own domestic record on these issues, we can be proud, even more proud, of the fact that we have brought democracy and human rights to a conflict that has been plagued and ravaged by war in every century of our history. And I think that's often lost in debates about the European Union, that enormous achievement, not just of bringing peace to Western Europe, but also as the Iron Curtain fell, taking democracy and human rights to the east of our continent as well. And when you think about the big issues facing the world, like climate change, for example, we're better placed to deal with these issues if we're working together rather than tackling them alone. Now, we've been accused on the Remain campaign of running Project Fear. Actually, it's Project Fact. And just because the facts are slightly alarming, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't talk about the risks, whether it's the risk to three million jobs or the risk to trade, where 44% of our exports are to the European Union, to the common market, valued at 229 billion in 2014, or to inward investment, where the UK is the largest recipient of foreign direct investment in Europe. And think about the implications of having to renegotiate our trading relationship, either with the European single market, in which case we're going to have to potentially, as other countries do, make contributions to the budget 
or abide by the rules without having any say in them, including free movement of people, which is a vexatious issue. I understand in lots of parts of the country during the course of this referendum, there isn't a better relationship than we can point to than we have now. And if we don't want to be part of the single market, then that is a fundamental shift not just in our economic policy, but our foreign policy, away from the democracies of the West to the dictatorships of the East. And that's not where I want to see this country realigning itself in the 21st century. Uh, we'd also need to think on a very practical level about who's going to renegotiate all of these trade agreements, whether it's individual trade agreements within the existing EU member states or, or for single market access, but also with the rest of the world, because so many of our existing trading relationships outside of the European Union are, negotiating, are negotiated through the European Union. And who's going to do it? We don't have the Board of Trade anymore. We, we have a business department which, where you know, most, of our, most of our people engaged in, in issues of trade and negotiating trade agreements are, are, are over in Brussels, where the action's at. Who's going to negotiate this? And how long will it take? How long will it take after we have left the European Union within a space of two years? How long will it take to negotiate these trade agreements with the EU member states or with the rest of the world? Finally, um, broadcasters and others have a responsibility to present balance in the debate. And so it's common to hear, uh, as we've had this morning, two people on a platform giving counterposing views. But it's not just about giving equal airtime. It's about making sure that we're giving adequate weight to the arguments that are being made and, of course, who is making them. And we should listen. We should listen, listen to the IMF. We should listen to the G20. We should listen to the Governor of the Bank of England. We should listen to the Institute for Fiscal Studies. We should listen to the majority of parliamentarians. We should listen to the vast majority of businesses. We should listen to the vast majority of trade unions. And we should listen very carefully to the risks that they set out of the consequences of leaving. This isn't just a debate about trade. This is a debate about our place in the world and how we exercise influence and sovereignty in a world where global power is shifting, the threats are changing, the uncertainty is greater. We can be proud of the leadership that we show to the world through the European Union and proud of our leadership on the global stage outside the European Union. But our influence will be greater still if we remain not just within the European Union but at the heart of the European Union. And that's why I believe we are stronger, safer, better off and you should vote to remain at the end of June.